Good afternoon, I am Natasha Williams at WHIO TV, Channel 7, Morning Anchor. We'll be talking with three of the winners of the Dayton Literary Peace Prize today. Richard Bosch, whose novel Peace is a recipient of the 2009 Fiction Award. E. Benjamin Skinner, whose book A Crime So Monstrous, Face to Face with the Modern Day Slavery. And Nicholas Kristoff, who with his wife, Cheryl Wudon, is being honored for a lifetime of observing and reporting on issues of greatest importance to our sense of humanity. We'll be hearing from them individually and we'll be asking questions of them in the Q&A session. After the panel, there will be an opportunity to have your books that you've purchased or still want to purchase signed. At this time, I'd like to introduce you Richard Bausch, author of Peace. Richard. That's up to you. What's speak? Thank you. Um, I uh, I want to do whatever you all want. Um, I'd be happy to read something from the book or talk about it. That seems to be the general consensus. Talk about it. Okay. Um, by the way, the name is pronounced Bausch, but it is also Bosch. It was Bosch all the way through the Air Force, so I don't mind Bosch, so don't worry about it. But it's, the pronunciation of Bausch rhymes with house if you're drunk. <laughs> um, but as I said, people call me Bosch, and it's fine. Um, but uh, um, Peace, the book, and I knew it was, I was going to call it Peace. Um, from the first minutes of thinking about it. Um, it's a, the core, the bones of it, the very central action in it, which is an act of mercy, it was something that happened to my father, and he told it when I was about 20 years old. I tried to write it as a story, and he read it, and he said what to me is still the, the, the most, I can't explain this, but it, it's the most pleasing thing anyone ever said to me about a story uh, that I'd written. He said, I disagree, as if it was a proposal or something that <laughs> okay. And he said, that's not how it happened. And he told me something else that had happened the day before and, and explained why the officer commanding him ordered him to take this old Italian man into the woods and shoot him. Um, and I was thinking about that other thing that he told me about that the day before they had upset a cart of straw and a German officer and a woman had tumbled out and uh, they arrested them and took them away. In the book, I had them shoot a couple of their number and the woman is then murdered. Um, and when I thought of that as something I would make up, I knew I had a subject for a book and I knew that it would, that the paradox of it would be that this is a war where it's this profligate killing going on and that these men have witnessed a murder in the middle of a war. Um, and so I began to write from that, and it came very quickly. Um, it took me six weeks to write it. And I would say to people, I'm working on a novel set in the terrible winter of 1944 in Italy, and it's called Peace. And um, I had no idea, beginning it, how it would end. Um, but I knew it felt, that there was only one way to say this, that, that it was making a pressure to be written. I took it with me on the road. I never write on the road, and I had it with me in Chattanooga. I took it with me you know, to various trips um, and worked on it in the motel rooms instead of you know, socializing in the evenings and stuff. I'd go back up to the room and work. And I had that marvelous feeling that a writer gets that is rare. Um, but wonderful when you have it. It's going to sound morbid, but it isn't. And that is this sense, almost a prayer, don't kill me before I finish this. You know, like, just don't let anything happen. This really needs to be written. Please let me live long enough to write it. Um, and so, for, I mean, I've written a, a, my 20th volume of writing is coming out in February. It's a book of stories called Something Is Out There. And I just published my first book of poems this fall, which is the 19th volume of work. And uh, even so, there was something about this book that felt 
so special, I guess, is because a lot of the, the, the sense that it came from my father, who was um, a good man and a strong man, and who went through these things. And uh, so it was almost as if he was standing over my shoulder, and I hope he was approving and not saying I disagree. <laughs> um, but that was the writing of it, and then when it was done, and um, Knopf published it, um, and then going around the country reading from it, um, I began to feel that there was some aspect of it that maybe I had failed at some way. I can't explain this except that you always feel like the book that you've just done is is just short of the book it could have been if you had it just one more time through it. I mean, I think that's always how we feel. Um, but then it started to, I started to get reactions from it. It won an award from the American Library Association this summer and then the, then the Dayton Peace Prize, which, uh, you know, it's a book about war. Bob Edwards, at, in his radio show, said to me, there's precious little peace in this book. And I said, well, there's precious little peace in the world. And so it's, but it's about peace. Peace um, always involves mercy. And for me, if you were to put the book into a homily-like sentence, it would be that a human being must be willing to show mercy to the devil himself, or else there's no hope for peace. So um, that's what the book's really about. If you look at the old Italian gentleman, he's got marks on his forehead, and uh, there's a thing faintly dishonest look about him, and everything he says is sophistry and lies, and he's a fascist. And at the very end, as uh, my soldier is standing there with the orders to shoot him, he says, it's a good that you die, and he still lets him go. So the whole book is a metaphor for what the world, you, know, you hope we can somehow find to practice in the world. So that's really all I have to say about it. Thank you. Mr. Bausch told you he's the author of nine other novels, seven volumes of short stories. His work has appeared in New Yorker, The Atlantic Monthly, Esquire, Playboy, GQ, Harper's Magazine, and other publications. And has been featured in a number of best collections, including the O. Henry Awards Best American Short Stories and New Stories from the South. In 2004, he won the Penn Mama Maud Award for Excellence in a Short Story. That is Richard Bausch. I'd like to introduce you to E. Benjamin Skinner, author of A Crime So Monstrous, Face-to-Face -face with Modern Day Slavery. A graduate of Wesleyan University, E. Benjamin Skinner was born in Wisconsin. He is currently a fellow at the Carr Center for Human Rights Policy at Harvard's Kennedy School of Government and previously served as a research associate for U.S. foreign policy at the Council on Foreign Affairs as well as special assistant to Ambassador Richard Holbrook. As a writer engaged in the study of the U.S. and global political economies, his articles have appeared in Newsweek International, Travel and Leisure, Los Angeles Times, the Miami Herald, Foreign Policy, and others. He lives in Brooklyn. Mr. Skinner. Thanks very much. Um, it's, uh, I have to first say it's a huge honor to be here, uh, a, a total surprise. Uh, given the caliber of the nominees um, that uh, when I got a, a, a sleepy call uh, after flying in from China uh, from my, my, our, my publicist wasn't sleepy, she was very excited, but uh, <laughs> I was quite sleepy and uh, they thought I was still, still dreaming. I've never won a, a literary award or any kind of writing prize before uh, and it was, a, it was a huge honor uh, to be uh, nominated in the first place, and then to be um, to be uh, 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 recognized uh, alongside uh, Richard and, and uh, Nicholas, who are uh, both idols of mine, um, and uh, particularly, as I said uh, at a d dinner here last night, um, I'm, I'm very gratified that um, uh, Thomas Friedman. Uh, is finally getting the recognition that he deserves uh, uh, and, and as, as he was the, the, the runner-up for this and he's languished in anonymity for so long. <laughs> um, but sincerely, I'm, I'm, I'm honored. It's also my first visit to, to Dayton and um, 
Dayton is a uh, is a place that has uh, always held sort of mythical qualities in my mind. Um, uh, as was mentioned, I, I worked for Ambassador Richard Holbrook uh, uh, after he left government for several years on a, a, a book that never came about, but hopefully someday will. Um, and uh, he would describe his time uh, in in Dayton in these um, in these glowing terms of um, of uh, accomplishing the the impossible, um, and uh, and so I've always seen it that way. It's a it's a it's a place where a man takes flight. It's a it's a place where uh, a, um, an impossible piece is is ha is hammered out between uh, uh, seemingly intractable. Uh, enemies, and um, uh, hopefully, it's a place where we begin to um, to talk and to, to act to end a crime that has been around for five thousand years, uh, and that is modern day slavery. Um, that is slavery, I should say. Uh, the, mo the, the modern the modern manifestation uh, is is no different in form than it has been for five thousand years. We're talking about people who are uh, forced to work held through fraud under threat of violence for no pay beyond subsistence. The principal difference today uh, is that fraud element. Um, in, the, in the past, uh, it, was a, it was an institution in this country um, that was um, a, a major part of the world economy, um, uh, and a, uh, an institution that was held up in, in many quarters in this country as being a Bible institution. As, um, as being something that was uh, ordained by God, um, that certain people would be slaves and certain people would be free. Today, we see slavery as an abomination. We have over a dozen universal uh, and international treaties and conventions of banning slavery in the slave trade. We have fought in this country um, uh, several wars for, for freedom. Um, my my ancestors, uh, my great great grandfather, fought in the uh, in the siege of Petersburg with with the Union Army, um, and 360,000 of his fellow Union soldiers died um, with uh, very much the the idea that we all have sort of taken as axiomatic that their sacrifice, uh, their blood, fertilized the Emancipation Proclamation and the uh, and the Thirteenth Amendment. And that was supposed to have done the job, and that was supposed to be the end of the story. We can, we can consign slavery to, to the, the sepia tone photographs of, of the past. Uh, the sad fact is that from, from where we are here, um, where we accomplish these impossible things, and where we are, um, uh, let's say, in the center of the moral universe, um, we are some maybe eight, uh, maybe 10 hours from being able to negotiate in broad daylight uh, the sale of a healthy boy or a girl. Um, and I was able to do this five hours from where I live uh, in, in Brooklyn. Actually, I just recently moved, unfortunately, to, uh, to Boston. Uh, <laughs> so I still, uh, the New York still hold, holds a place in my heart. But, um, uh, but five hours from where I, I lived when I was writing this book uh, in Brooklyn, New York, uh, I was able to, uh, first of all, if you take an, an hour uh, taxi ride from Atlantic and Smith to, to JFK International Airport, fly for three hours, land in Port-au-Prince, Haiti. Uh, there, an hour from the airport in Port-au-Prince, there's a barber shop. And everybody in the neighborhood knew what these uh, men who were standing in front of the barber shop did. I pulled up in a car, rolled down a window, one of the men came over and said, uh, do you want to get a person? And at that point, we began to negotiate. Um, he told me all about his business. I told him I was a reporter. I had the, I had the tape recorder out the whole time. Uh, but because there was no comprehensive law on human trafficking uh, in 2005, and because the time that I was visiting, um, there was no uh, functional uh, government beyond the interim government. Uh, this is after the, the coup that um, that sent him to exile um, the, um, the, the previous uh, president. Um, this man was operating perfectly freely with, with um, uh, a total sense of impunity. Um, and the person that he offered to me 
was would have been uh, were I to buy this uh, this child one of uh, th uh, this is the UNICEF estimate three hundred thousand children held in forced domestic service. Um, this child, I made it clear I would want this child to cook, to clean. I wanted this child to um, to take care of all of my material needs in my house. I wouldn't pay the child, of course, but I would give the child a, a place to sleep on the floor. Uh, and I made, I made it clear that I wanted a 12-year-old, and I made it clear that I wanted a girl. And at a certain point, my um, the, the translator, whose real name is Benabil, um, uh, leaned in, and Benabil said to me, this is rather a delicate question, but would you want this child as a, as a partner, as well as a, as a domestic slave? And for the majority of those 300,000 uh, child slaves in Haiti, ma the vast majority of whom are girls, sexual abuse is part and parcel of their bondage. The, um, the asking price for this child, the asking price was $100. And the negotiated price after about five minutes was 50 US dollars, which I understood to be still more than Benabel made on his average negotiated sale. Um, it, at the time that my ancestors were standing on soapboxes, I come from a long line of Quakers in this country. Um, uh, going, uh, going back, my family goes back to the Mayflower in the, in the 19th century. They were um, soapbox abolitionists. Uh, I had a great, great, great grandmother who was a Quaker minister in the days when Quakers had ministers and, and went abroad and um, uh, railed against the traffic in men body. Uh, at that time, in the mid-19th century, you could buy a healthy male uh, on the open market for the equivalent, uh, in today's dollars, of about $40,000. Um, and this is not to diminish the dehumanization, the degradation, uh, the abomination um, uh, that slavery was then and has, and has been throughout history, but it is to say that those that purchased slaves in the mid-19th century generally viewed them as an investment. Um, uh, an investment in, in something less than a human being, uh, but an investment nonetheless. And, and uh, those slaves would be whipped, those slaves would be beaten. But in general, they, they were seen as something to, to keep alive. Uh, today, when you can travel eight hours from where we're sitting and purchase a healthy girl for domestic and sexual slavery, and the asking price is $100, the negotiated price is $50. These people are, in, in the term of my friend and colleague, Kevin Bales, who wrote the seminal work on this, uh, disposable people. Um, these, these people are disposable. Um, and um, so uh, what I did throughout the book was to try to find um, not only uh, uh, traffickers, uh, but also slaves and survivors, and to tell their stories uh, and to allow them to speak through me and their their courage in speaking to me. And I know uh, I know Nick uh, would echo this um, is is overwhelming. Why those who have had their uh, trust shattered um, would would then um, take faith in us as journalists? Um, to relay their stories accurately um, is sometimes hard to fathom. And I, I act on the assumption um, that it is because they intend for us to take those stories and affect a greater good. Um, uh, as, as journalists, um, we take on that idea, first to seek truth and tell it, and second, to, to do no harm. But when you're writing about subjects like we write about, these, these are not subjects that lend themselves to neutrality at the end of the day. Um, and uh, I, one of my models for the book was uh, Samantha Power's magnificent book on genocide, A Problem from Hell. And um, she has been, uh, along with uh, Nick, very high in my pantheon of heroes over the years, and I'm, I'm honored to say I've gotten to know her. Um, and I realized over the course of this book 
um, not just in Haiti, but throughout the countries that I visited. I realized when I was in, for example, a, an underground brothel in Bucharest, and I was offered a young woman for, for uh, in trade for a used car, and this young woman had the visible effect of Down syndrome, and all over one of her arms she had slashes where I can only assume that she was trying to escape daily rape the only way that she knew how. Um, I realized that the difference between what I was working on and what Samantha had so eloquently put together is that is that she was writing about victims who were no longer with us. And the victims that I was writing about are still very much with us. And they are still uh, very much in jeopardy and in, in many cases in hell. Um, so I want to thank you very much for, for uh, for having me here, for having us here, and for honoring me this way. And, and I hope you pick up the book, and I hope you join the cause. Thank you. Nicholas Kristoff and Cheryl Wudan have won the Lifetime Achievement Award for their promotion of peace through understanding by bringing to light the issues that divide one person from another, one country from another, one gender from another. Nicholas D. Kristoff and Cheryl Wudan are the first married couple to receive a Pulitzer Prize in journalism. They won for their coverage of China as New York Times correspondents. Mr. Kristoff won a second Pulitzer for his op-ed columns in the Times. He also served as bureau chief in Hong Kong, Beijing, and Tokyo as an associate managing editor. At the Times, Ms. Wudan worked as a business <coughs> editor and a foreign correspondent in Tokyo and Beijing. They lived near New York City, is that correct? Okay. Just in case you moved. <laughs> Jeff Bruce, writer and former editor of the Dayton Daily News and a current professor at Wright State University, has a special presentation to Nick and Jeff. Yeah. Caught you by surprise, didn't we? Yeah. Um, <laughs> We have here uh, certificates uh, for both uh, Nick and Cheryl from Ohio Secretary of State Jennifer Bruner. Uh, very nice certificates. And they say in part, I won't read everything, but uh, to Nick, she writes, it's my privilege to recognize and commend Nicholas Kristof for being named the 2009 Dayton Literary Peace Prize Lifetime Achievement Award honoree at the Dayton Literary Peace Prize. Uh, the Certificate of Commendation is tendered on behalf of the people of the state of Ohio as a small token of their gratitude and sincere admiration for the exemplary work of Nicholas Kristof. By investing of his knowledge and resources, he has chronicled human rights in Asia, Africa, and the developing world, making him most deserving of this award that recognizes the power of the written word to promote peace. The accomplishments and consistent successes of Nicholas Kristof are testaments to what can be done for the lives of others and for our communities. His path serves as an inspiration to others, what they can achieve with similar exemplary attitude, dedication, and spirit. There you go. Thank you very much, uh, Jeff and Natasha. Uh, I'm really delighted to be here. Uh, I'm honored to be with two extraordinary authors. Um, Cheryl and I must say we did feel a little bit aged to win a lifetime achievement. <laughs> We're each only 89 years old. <laughs> um, the Cheryl also sends her regrets of not being here. We have three kids, uh, three teenagers, and so we. Uh, rarely traveled together. Uh, if we did, we'd probably return to fewer than the three we started out with. <laughs> um, but uh, she, she sends her regrets. Our book, in a sense, our latest book, uh, Half the Sky, started out uh, actually when we were posted together in China and uh, observing things there. And so I thought I would just start by telling you a story from that period in China, because it goes to a couple of the themes in the book. We were Back, way back in 1990, we went off to the middle of the country, to Hubei province, which was a, a poor area. We went to the Dabia Mountains there and to write about school dropouts. And it turned out that essentially all the people dropping out of school were girls because 
their parents on the one hand didn't have a lot of money, but beyond that, they really didn't think it was important to spend that scarce money on a daughter as opposed to a son. And in particular, in one school, we found the brightest kid there, a girl named Dai Manju, had had to drop out because her parents didn't want to pay $13 in school fees. We wrote a front page article about this in the New York Times, and predictably, we were soon deluged with checks from readers, mostly for $13. <laughs> New York Times readers can be a little bit cheap occasionally. <laughs> but um, we also did get one wire transfer for $10,000 to help Dime on you. That uh, was quite extraordinary. We knew it would revolutionize that area. We took all this money down to the community, worked out a deal with the principal, with the school authorities, whereby thereafter, all girls in the community would be able to stay in school as long as they could do the work. Uh, that for the first time, your academic achievement in this community would be a function not of your chromosomes, but of your intellectual capacity. The girls were thrilled. Uh, I called up the donor of that $10,000 to give him a report. And I thanked him for his generosity. And I said, you just would not believe how far $10,000 will go in rural China. <laughs> well, there was sort of a confused pause. And he said, uh, $10,000? Uh, I only sent $100. Oh. That's exactly what I said. <laughs> As a trained investigative reporter, I knew there was a problem here. <laughs> and well, it turned out indeed that he had only sent, uh, or tried to send a wire of $100. Um, his bank had had a little difficulty with a decimal point. <laughs> That banker presumably later was put in charge of subprime mortgages, you figure? <laughs> well, I didn't know what to do. I couldn't imagine telling all these girls that they would not be able to stay in school after all. I'm not really proud of what I did next. I called up the chief spokesman for the bank. It was Morgan Guarantee. And uh, if you ever want to actually support the Dayton Literary Peace Prizes, be sure to send your money through Morgan Guarantee. <laughs> um, but, uh, and I explained the situation very bluntly to him and how, how there had been this mistake and how all these girls were hoping to stay in school. And I said, um, now, on the record, do you plan to dispatch a lot of bankers to that community and get the money back and force all these girls to drop out of school? He said, well, on the record, under the circumstances, we're pleased to make a donation of the difference. <laughs> so we began to see a fascinating natural experiment with what happens when you have this sudden investment in girls' education in a way that you didn't have in all the other areas. And make no mistake, throughout the region, everybody became better off, people became more educated, but this community was utterly transformed in a way that was not true of others. Uh, the girl in question, Dai Manchu, became the first person in her family to get a elementary education, a middle school education, a high school education, and then she earned an accounting degree. Uh, she went off to Guangdong province and uh, became an accountant, sent money back. So many other girls who might otherwise have been working in the rice paddies went off, got great jobs, sent money back. Because this community then had more money, they were able to convince the authorities to build a better road to the area, to start more development projects. And as a result, you began to see this virtuous cycle of development, educational investment, prosperity in this community in a way that was not true of the others. And it was all, at the end of the day, because of this one-time mistake uh, by this banker. Um, and uh, in a sense, that goes to the uh, two themes of Half the Sky. And the first goes to the point that the kids who had to drop out and very often the victims of so many other injustices, including those that, that, that Ben has written so eloquently about, are girls. Uh, and so the first theme of the book is simply that just as in uh, the 19th century, the central moral challenge was slavery, and in the 20th century, the paramount moral challenge was totalitarianism, in this century, the central moral challenge, the cause of our times, is gender inequity around the globe. Now, when I say that, I think people tend to think that's hyperbole, it's a bit of an exaggeration, and it's really not meant that way at all. I really mean that very deliberately, very bluntly. And to explain why, let me ask you a question. Are there more males or females in the world today? I want to put it, let's uh, 
take out a vote. If you think there are more males in the world today, can you raise your hand? Oh, if, you yeah, that, yeah. <laughs> if you think there are more females in the world today, can you raise your hand? I'm afraid you're wrong. Uh, yeah, ben was right. <laughs> I, I, I was at the UN when you were talking about this. <laughs> uh, well, uh, we think that there are more females because in the US there are more females, in Europe there are more females. Given equal access to food and health care, there are women live longer, so there should be more females. In an equitable world, there are more females. Worldwide, because of inequity, because so many people are discriminated against to death, there are in fact substantially more males than females. And it's, it's called gender side is one measure of the cost of this kind of gender discrimination. There are between 60 and 100 million women missing around the globe, depending on how you do the math. It's more women uh, who killed or because, were killed because of their gender, then men died in all the battles and uh, all the wars of the 20th century. And that is one reason why, indeed, it, it I think should be taken as the paramount moral challenge of this century. The other uh, point, though, is a maybe more positive one, and just putting aside all the moral questions, what is right and what is wrong, as a purely practical matter, if you want to address global poverty, if you want to address terrorism, violence, civil conflict, as a purely practical matter, the most cost-effective way of doing that is to educate girls, empower women, bring them into the formal economy, and watch that kind of a virtuous spiral unfold that I described in, in that Chinese village. Uh, more and more, to put it another way, we're realizing that women and girls aren't the problem, they're the solution. <laughs> And um, these days in Afghanistan, because the generals have discovered that one of the best metrics for determining stability in any given district is the proportion of girls who are educated there, you get these hard-bitten generals who one moment are talking about airstrikes, the next moment are talking about getting more girls in school. Uh, it's a measure of this pragmatic uh, effect. There are a couple of questions that people sometimes ask. One is, um, I mean, I think there are a lot of people who would like to get engaged in these kinds of issues, either because it feels like the right thing to do or because they Want to set an example for their kids or grandkids, whatever it may be, an example of compassion and empathy. But they're also worried about corruption, they're worried about big aid bureaucracies, and they're worried about really whether it makes a difference at the grassroots level. And you know, I want to acknowledge that these are legitimate questions. These are all problems. Anybody who has traveled in the developing world has seen a lot of investments that have gone awry. But it's also true that anybody who has traveled has seen so many examples of projects that have gone wonderfully, just that have been transformative. Um, and the, now we have a much better sense of what works and what doesn't work. There are so many things that we can do that will work that, in fact, we're not doing. And um, another question that I think people, in fact, we, I was just speaking about this with the reporter from the Daily News. Uh, uh, is this perception that to engage in these issues, whether it's global poverty or human trafficking uh, or these broader issues, that it's just incredibly depressing. And it doesn't really feel like kind of a happy cause to take on. And I think that that may be an error that we in the humanitarian world broadly construed make, that we emphasize all the things that are going wrong. I'm always struck that if I interview a humanitarian, they tend to talk about the problems. If I interview a CEO of a corporate um, entity, they always emphasize they're such incredibly optimistic about the future, even as their own company is going down the toilet. <laughs> and I think that's actually something maybe we should learn more about. And the truth is that reporting from Darfur, war in Eastern Congo, brothels in Cambodia, you see some terrible, terrible things. And you get so angry at some of the things you see. Um, my last trip to Cambodia, I saw a 13-year-old girl who had been kidnapped, and then the brothel owner, she'd been sold to it, had her, had, the brothel owner had gouged out this girl's eye. We just want to kill that brothel owner. But side by side, invariably, with the worst of humanity, you see the very best. You see just unbelievable people out there and here making a difference in the lives of people by that 13-year-old girl. That 13-year-old was being looked after by a woman who herself had been trafficked and then had escaped from the brothels and now is devoting her life 
to looking after others, to taking them in, to sheltering them, using, risking her life, spending her resources to help them. And is supported by so many Americans who uh, volunteer for her, write checks, whatever. And so at the end of the day, I come back from trips like that, and I'm you know, angry at that broth boner, uh, hard, I mean, seared by that kind of tragedy in that site. But maybe above all, I'm really moved and inspired by those people who are making a difference, who are expressing their humanity by trying to help other human beings around them. And, and that is my takeaway. And in contrast, what I sometimes do find depressing is to come back to this country and see people for whom the greatest expression of their humanity is to have a hot new car or the latest iPod or cell phone. And that, that is what is truly depressing, as opposed to being a part of something that is larger than ourselves. Thank you very much for having me here. And now is the really fun part. We get to ask questions. We've heard the authors in their own words, and now is a chance for you to verbalize the questions that you've been thinking about or you've read about through their books and had through their books. <clears throat> so let's kick it off. Does someone have a question they'd like to start off with? Now all at once. I'll take it. Well, no, it's like bad. I haven't uh, read your book yet, but uh, listening to you talk, or is there... There are times when you were like in danger, you were threatened, uh, you were worried that some harm was going to come to you when you're researching this, this type of uh, situation? Just pass it around. Thanks. Um, I think. Uh, Can you repeat the question, please? Oh, the, the question is um, were, there, were there moments where I was in jeopardy um, uh, during the book? Um, and um, the answer is. Uh, yes, but uh, you know, I, I'm. I'm. It's typically phrased. You know, was I worried? Was I? Was, how was I not paralyzed by fear in these moments? And I, um, I, I, I want to hear Nick's response on this as well because he's been through some um, uh, very hairy situations. I remember reading a, a, a column of in um, uh, Tiananmen um, in the in the early '90s where you were describing the perspiration. And, and I, that just stayed with me because I, um, um, I've, I felt that at various points. I typically feel it the night before, um, and then when I'm in the moment, I'm so overwhelmed with concern, not for myself, because I, we're hard targets as Americans, and there's a, there's a real sort of um, cost to whoever is going to do something to us. They, there will be retaliation, but the, um, I'm more concerned that if my cover is blown, if I'm if I'm going undercover, and I know this is something that uh, a lot of journalists aren't allowed to do, but as an independent journalist writing the book, um, you know, I knew that I knew that I couldn't set up uh, interviews through a, a, uh, the traffickers publicist, um, and so, and so I have to go in using whatever uh, means are necessary in order to get a, to get a real sort of detailed story from them. Um, I knew, but I knew that if my cover was blown. Typically, I wouldn't be the first um, uh, person to be taken out. It would be, uh, 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 or hurt, or physically intimidated. It would be um, those that are, that are under their immediate control and who they might be afraid would testify against them. Um, and so I was, um, I was overwhelmingly concerned with protecting them. Um, and uh, I, I was happy to, um, not happy, but I, I knew that I had one person who was, um, 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 uh, overly concerned about my physical security, overly concerned, I think, that was my mother. Um, and uh, uh, I was mainly concerned that, that, that she was uh, able to sleep through the nights, and so I would check in with her periodically. But she's getting more used to this now. I was in, um, I was reporting for Time Magazine this summer in, um, uh, in South Africa. Uh, um, it's a, a story that'll come out uh, uh, this later this month on um, sex trafficking around the World Cup stadiums. And um, as part of that, um, uh, at, at one point, uh, in the beginning of the night, I was interviewing a, uh, a young woman, a girl, uh, who was 17 years old, um, named Sindiswa, which ironically means saved in Zulu. Um, and she had, um, 
she was, it was a freezing cold state run hospice and she was dying alone. Uh, she had uh, been sold a year, over a year earlier uh, into this Nigerian human trafficking syndicate. And um, she had at that point full blown AIDS, um, tuberculosis, and she was three months pregnant. Um, she'd been kicked out of, of, the, um, uh, of, of this brothel because she could no longer stand up and she'd literally been thrown on the street been picked up by a good Samaritan who had taken her to the hospital and um, they quickly um, checked her out into a hospice, hospice care. And um, she um, wound up dying a week later. Um, and I was the first and last person to sort of to take her story. And at the end of that, there was a street minister who was there with me, a controversial guy that I read about in the piece named uh, Andre Lombard, who was uh, trained uh, in the South African Special Forces. And he said to me, um, and this wasn't a question, it was the tone was definitely declarative rather than interrogative. Um, he said, where is the trafficker? And I knew that we were gonna go find this guy. And this guy Jude was um, primarily a, a, a crack dealer. That's how he started out. And then he discovered that he could make more money over the long term. You know, he would sell a gram of crack for $50, uh, the equivalent of $50 a grand. Um, and a, um, a girl he could buy um, for $35, and if he held on to her, he could sell her again and again every night. Um, and on average, these girls would, would make about 45 to $60 a night. Um, so it was a, a business proposition that just made so much sense to him. Anyway, we um, wound up, uh, uh, the, the, the story in Time Magazine is more detailed, and I have to respect the, the, the time paid, is paying me for this, so I, I can't reveal everything, but I will say that we wound up going and um, uh, and finding, uh, finding this guy, and going in, and um, uh, and there was a fight. Um, I wasn't involved, but I was told um, uh, going in by Andre, you know, if there if there's any trouble, I'll take out the big guy. Um, he and his street ministers are always armed. Um, this is after one of one of the one of the ministers was killed. Uh, one of the traffickers had sharpened a bicycle spoke and run it through his lungs, um, and. Um, uh, as Andre put it, he died like a dog on the streets, and that he was intent on not having that happen to him. You know, those are the guys that are really in danger. Um, and I don't necessarily condone that kind of conf confrontational tactic. Again, I'm, you know, in that case, I'm really seeking truth and telling it. I'm just telling the story and not trying to endorse it. Um, but it, it was revelatory to me um, just how much danger those that um, whether using effective tactics or not, put themselves in on a daily basis, and we don't even hear about them. Um, and so it's, uh, that's, that's why it's worth getting involved, uh, I think, with groups like Free the Slaves, um, which I've been, uh, which is the American wing of Anti-Slavery International. Um, they have partners worldwide that um, put themselves in danger uh, every day, do so to no acclaim, um, and, um, and you know, in as much as um, we can make a difference from the safety here, and, uh, in, in, uh, from our safety here in Dayton and throughout the United States, it's it's worthwhile doing so. Nick, do you want to add? Well, I, I absolutely agree with Ben. I mean, that yeah, frankly, in these places, you tend to have a certain amount of protect, protection um, as a foreigner. Um, and the people who end up taking the risks are your interpreter, your driver, uh, and I also have perfected the art because my column is, is twice a week of um, having my, uh, my nastiest columns try to, where I can, appear after I've left the area in question. You try not to write about a warlord when you're in the warlord's control. Um, I learned that lesson the hard way, actually. But, uh, you know, your interpreter, your driver are uh, staying behind. Often the people that you interview retelling their stories are taking incredible risks. The people who moved me the most in that respect, maybe, were some of the women in Dart who, were, who had been raped and who told their stories. Um, in Sudan, if you acknowledge that you have been raped, then that is punishable. Uh, if you are unmarried uh, as fornication, if you're married as adultery, because you don't provide for adult male witnesses to the act to prove that it was rape, and you're acknowledging that sex occurred uh, outside of marriage, 
And yet those women were uh, willing to tell me their stories, uh, let me use their names and take video of them. And I just agonized over whether I was putting them at risk. And I, I tried to make sure that the consent I was getting was real. And I remember uh, one woman in particular uh, telling me you know, you know, that she, she knew it, she agreed. And so I asked, well, why are you willing to take this risk? And she said, this is the only way I have to fight genocide. It's the only thing I have. And I will never forget you know, that kind of courage. And those are the people who, uh, I mean, it, it always upsets me because I see such unbelievable moral courage on the part of people like that, whether it's in Darfur or in, in the red light districts, that wherever. And then um, world leaders have shown almost zero moral courage confronting so many of these issues. Uh, ben, and going back on, you talked about when you uh, arrived in Haiti, mm. and it was just immediate that someone came up to you and uh, basically said, I have what you need, what do you need, that type of thing. Even with laws that are in place or things, policies that go in place to protect um, some of these things from happening, it still seems to be a thing that is just too easy, just extremely easy to, for you to get access to a person, to a girl, to a boy, to whatever, and for such a minimal cost. Um, I, I want to be clear, I don't want to leave you with the impression that um, somebody approached me as soon as I got off the plane in, in Haiti, um, I, but it certainly is, um, uh, it certainly is very easy, um, uh, frighteningly easy to, thank you, um, to access uh, people that are uh, in extraordinarily vulnerable situations to the point of being uh, forced into prostitution and work. Um, and. Um, uh, you know, the laws, I think, matter. The, um, the, the struggles that, that we went through, uh, that our ancestors went through, who are slaves and abolitionists, um, uh, to, to uh, uh, enshrine the Emancipation Proclamation, to, to push the 13th Amendment forward, to abolish slavery, um, all of those matter. That's, that, that was a necessary part of the overall abolitionist movement. Um, but it doesn't mean the end of slavery. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's interesting to note that in, um, we in this country um, last year celebrated the 200th anniversary of the abolition of the slave trade. Um, and people tend to, tend to forget that. And in uh, 1807 was the uh, uh, 200th anniversary of the ab abolition of the slave trade in, um, in the UK. Um, and yet, after that abolition, there was some of the worst, most horrendous um, uh, uh, examples of uh, internal uh, slave trading in, within the United States of, of uh, breeding, of, of the, the, the wholesale um, uh, slaughter at, at various points of, of, uh, of slaves. Um, and, um, uh, and so, you know, just passing a law is not enough. Um, and just saying that something is a crime doesn't make it so. I was in, I remember I was in um, northern India in, um, in Bihar, uh, and I was talking to uh, a man whose title was social secretary of Araria, which was um, actually, which there's Araria, and then there's a town, there's a town that literally means Araria bus stop. Um, and the Araria bus stop was one of these big trafficking points for, for children where they were, um, they would then be taken down into the carpet belt, in particular in Uttar Pradesh, um, and uh, forced into the carpet looms. And um, I had just spent the last two weeks talking to survivors, and um, and then uh, using uh, lesser subterfuge, talking to loom owners, um, who would talk to me about how they uh, trap these children using debts and force them to work, uh, beat them regularly. Um, until in some cases their bones were deformed and they were forced to work uh, again under threat of violence, uh, never paid. And I, I told this social secretary who was, his, he was nominally responsible for protecting these children. I said, you know, I'm here writing a book about uh, slavery and he immediately cut me off and he said, for God's sake, don't go writing about brutal slavery here. We have no steel pens. 
It is not the, the highest, uh, is not the highest virtues that govern the universe, but it is impossible that slavery can exist in this country where we have abolished slavery. And I was sort of stunned, and he could tell I was stunned. He said, you know, let me explain something to you. And then he, and he poor people are irrational, he said. So I compare them to monkeys. Um, and he proceeded to tell me this story about how on a hot day a mother monkey will uh, will put her child, her baby monkey, down on the on the scalding earth and climb up in a tree to keep her own feet from burning. And that was why this man uh, said mothers sold their children into slavery. And this was the guy that was responsible for for freeing them, a government official. Um, and um, and so, you know, the, the, again, laws are great. We need laws, but, but real enforcement has to, has, to, um, has to be in place. And I, I, I want to also pass the mic to Nick very briefly, because I know Nick's been doing work. Um, in terms of the proximity of this, let's not forget that this is not just a Haiti phenomenon, an India phenomenon, an Africa phenomenon. It's an American phenomenon. Um, and, uh, and right here in Ohio and across the country, uh, there are thousands uh, that that we uh, that the Justice Department estimates are trafficked into into slavery every year.